Dr. Marla here. I'm so excited. I'm at the beautiful Gaylord Opryland Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee. And I've been filming people all week. I'm excited to have today on the program an archaeologist who did archaeological digs in Israel. She's informative, she's encouraging, she's passionate about her work. She's an archaeologist, a speaker, a graduate from Harvard. You don't want to miss this informative word, so stay tuned. Welcome to the show, everybody. We're so excited to have Amanda Hope Haley today. Amanda is a theologian and an archaeologist, yeah. and I'm so thrilled to have her because how many women could say they're a theologian and an archaeologist? More than you might think, actually. Well, I'm glad. But More than we might not think. as many as there should be. Not as many as there should be. But anyway, we're glad to have her today. Amanda has written two phenomenal books that you'll want to be aware of. One of those is Mary Magdalene Never Wore Blue Eyeshadow. And ladies out there, you're going to want to get this book. It's a great book. And then the other one is The Red-Haired Archaeologist. Go and tell the people about your books, about your life. And, and so, Amanda, um, tell me, first of all, how did you come up with the title? And how did you come up with the book mm -hmm. about Mary Magdalene? Yeah. Well, I, I grew up in a conservative Christian home. And I had a deep love of the Bible early in my life, and so I ended up going to school and studying theology academically. And when at I was Harvard, at, at Harvard, <laughs> yes, I got my master's degree at Harvard. Harvard. So um, it's a master's of Hebrew scripture and interpretation, which functionally worked out to be archaeology, but um, it, that's just that's what they call it. So I was sitting in a class working on my master's, and we were reading the Gospel of Mary, which is a non-canonical gospel. It's not in your Bible for a lot of really good reasons. And, but we were reading the story and considering it as literature. And in the story, Jesus has just given some special secret knowledge to Mary Magdalene. And she's trying to share it with the disciples, but they don't seem to have any interest in hearing it. And so we're discussing this in class and the teaching fellow asks those of us sitting around the table, hey, you know, why do you think the apostles didn't wanna hear what Mary Magdalene had to tell them? And I raised my hand, I was confident in my answer. And I said, well, maybe because she was a prostitute. And there was another student sitting across from me and he started laughing and he leaned back in his chair and he just asked, how on earth did you get to Harvard and not know that Mary Magdalene was not a prostitute? And you're like, I'm going to die right here. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I like, either, oh. all the blood drained from my face. I'm sure. And I, I looked over at the teaching fellow and he, he understood what was going on and he was really great and kind. And he said, you know, a lot of Christians believe that that's the truth because in the 500s, Pope Gregory the Great and understands. From the Catholic Church. Yeah. So in the 500s, there was only the Catholic Church. Right. Exactly. If, if you were in the West. If, if you were Christian, you were Catholic. And most people, the Bible had not been translated into English yet or right. into the other common so that was languages. In the 1500s. And so if people were literate, odds are they weren't literate in Hebrew and Greek and all that. So when they heard the Pope say something or heard later that the Pope had said something, that was gospel right. to them. That, that was scripture. It was as good as the Bible. And so he in, a, he in a homily just told everybody, he was actually talking about the woman washing Jesus' feet in the Bible, and she doesn't have a name. And he wanted her to have a name because I guess that just would have been easier for him. And so he just looked in the Bible and eight verses later is the verse where Jesus uh, meets Mary Magdalene and he casts demons out of her. She has a name. So for the benefit of this homily, he tells everybody that that's the same woman, the woman washing Je the sinner washing Jesus' feet okay. um, had, was Mary Magdalene. And over a little time, bit wrong. A little bit wrong there. I mean, he, you know, there are a lot of places in the Bible. This is something I like to talk about a lot. There are a lot of things in the Bible that we wish it would tell us, but it doesn't. Right. And a lot of mysteries. A lot too. of people. And, and Pope Gregory, he saw, I guess, what he thought was a hole in the Bible and he decided to fill it. Yeah. But that was him doing that. Right. That wasn't That's actually what scriptural. scripture said. Right. And so, you know, for 1,500 plus years now, he identified Mary Magdalene as that sinner. But 
the story kind of grew as gossip does. And she was a sinner. And so people would start talking and writing and theologians would write, well, what kind of sinner was she? And eventually sexual sin got attached to her. And over time, just the unnamed sinner became this prototypical Protestant Mary Magdalene, or uh, prostitute, not Protestant, <laughs> prostitute Mary Magdalene. And so he explained this to us in class. And on the way home, I called my mom and I told her what happened, and my mother just, sh she wouldn't have it, and she's like, no, 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 I know that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, because when I was little, we did an Easter play at my church, and I played Mary Magdalene, and your grandmother, she covered my face in makeup, and she put blue eyeshadow on my eyelids so that everyone would know that I was the prostitute Mary Magdalene. So that's where the blue eyeshadow that's comes That's where the story, in. yeah, the blue that's where it comes from. The eyeshadow story comes from your mom yeah. playing in a play in grade school, yeah, thinking Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. Exactly. That makes sense, and if you notice, this book has the, the blue <laughs> eyeshadow, so I love that, because you captured that. That's where the title and the book cover comes from. The, I love that. The people who did, the, it's a beautiful book cover. I, yeah, the people who created that, that is not, art is not my talent, um, but they, they did a really great job. It's well, pretty. this book, I, I mean, it's just amazing. Some of your titles in this book, Indiana Jones and the Buried Scriptures. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, and then uh, King Arthur's many authors, mm -hmm. Seeing Cinderella's slipper clearly, you kind of use a lot of fictional history. I do. History from fiction to kind of make what is real history in your points. Yeah. Um, how did you, I mean, tell me some about some of your book. Well, the book really is hermeneutics. And my passion after what happened to me at Harvard, that, that was sort of the point at which I realized that I, being raised with the Bible, there were so many things that I think are in the Bible, that I thought the Bible says that they simply don't. It was uh, tradition. It, it, you learned tradition, but you didn't know if it was scriptural. Exactly. Sounds like that took you on a journey. It did. And one thing, and I'm, I'm still realizing this every time I open the Bible, it is so much harder to realize what isn't in the Bible as opposed to what is in there. Because when you're just reading about Mary Magdalene, if, you're, you, know, hold, if you hold this belief that she's a prostitute, you just put that in there. That's how you imagine her. And there's nothing in the Bible, in this text, to make you go, hey, wait a minute. This is what I, what I believe is wrong. And so... She had seven demons, but right. it never says prostitute. No, and it, it doesn't even say what the demons are. It doesn't say what they are or what she was doing, it nothing. It doesn't. And over time, actually, even in that homily, the Pope started this. He wanted to identify those with the seven deadly sins and all that, but that is all extra scriptural. Right. It's not, it doesn't come from the Bible, it's something he said about it. And so my passion has become, has become helping people understand what is scripture versus what they believe about it. Traditions, Traditions yeah. versus what is real and truth. It is. And we need to separate the two from we what do. a lot of people teach as tradition, what we believe yeah. and what is really in the Bible. Exactly. And not to knock tradition. There are so many beautiful traditions that right. come out exactly. of Christianity. I mean, things, the things that we do at Christmas time and all of that, it's not to knock those, but we need to understand that they developed out of our culture um, and they are, they are not ordained by God in scripture. <laughs> there well, is a one difference. thing that would totally blow people's mind is Jesus was not born on December 25th. I know, that's but, true. But, you know, I don't want to blow everyone's mind, but it's true. He it was is. not born in that time frame. But that's okay because yeah. we get to celebrate him every year exactly. on December 25th, but that is a tradition. It is. There's a lot of things with Christmas. One one thing I like to, to talk about, I've, I've got a children's book coming out next year. Oh, I, I have a children's line, and it's um, it stars my dog, and it's called Copper Finds a Manger. And I'm going to be talking about or explaining to children the differences between our nativity scenes and what the Bible actually says. Because just at the very basic level, Jesus was not born in a barn. We think that because of our nativities, but our nativities were developed during the Italian Renaissance. The, the clothing that our characters wear in the nativity scene, they actually come from that. They come from the Christian tradition. Right. It's not scriptural. And when you dig into archeology, span it's not archeological span at all. Mangers were a stone trough. boxes. They're right. made of stone. The, the they animals weren't wood. drink out of. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the way we picture things are not historically archeologically accurate. 
there's nothing necessarily wrong, wrong with that, that right. because there are traditions. Because we're celebrating Jesus and we it are is our tradition, and that's okay. But we should know. But you we know, should it's, know. It's, it's better. That's right. it's, it's a step, I think, in us growing and you know, understanding, getting that much closer to God. I agree. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. I want to know about the Cinderella chapter. Sure. Um, well, so what I did with this book is... I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the Bible, but I like to use other forms of literature, even some pop culture, to help people understand the Bible you know, as a book. So um, Mary Magdalene, yeah, or, um, Cinderella, seeing um, her slipper clearly, the story of Cinderella um, grew out of oral tradition. And so with Cinderella, I, I did some research on it, and I always kind of thought that the story of Cinderella started with the, the Grimm brothers. And there have been lots of adaptations of Cinderella over time, our cartoons. I love the movie Ever After that came out in, I don't know, the late 90s or early 2000s. I just, I thought that was a beautiful version of it. And so I started researching. I thought, well, I'm sure whatever Grimm wrote, that has to be it. That has to be canon, if you will. That has to be the accurate Cinderella. And I learned that, no, the story goes back much, much further. I mean, even, even back into the 1000s, there are early versions of it in, in Japan and no all sorts of other of cultures. Cinderella. Yeah. And so that chapter is about peeling away some of these traditions and what some different cultures may say about the Bible and how they've taken what is originally the text and added to it and spun it so that it fits their own cultures a little bit better. Um, and then, you know, actually getting back to what is that source material. And, you know, for us, for Christianity, the Bible should be our source and not the traditions. Well, and, you know, there's scripture that says all kinds of things like women should wear a veil and we oh. should greet one another with a holy kiss. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole lot of things in there that sure. have adapted and changed that we don't do in the churches today. That's true. You know, because our culture's not like it was then. That's true. We, we wouldn't have worn something like this that we have on, you know, our clothing yeah. and different things. So I know you tell me that this book spun off into ar your archaeological book, it right? Did. And so it what did. tell me how that happened, which chapter it is and how that played out. So when I when I left Harvard, um, like I think a lot of the young couples did, did do. Did you hear that when she left Harvard? How many, I did graduate. I, I know that I'm not sure I made that clear. No, I mean you graduated, <laughs> but I think it's awesome that we have you. Oh, thanks. That, because you know, honestly, how many women were in your class? Um well, I just, uh, well, so I was at the Divinity School, and within my, I was in Near Eastern Civilizations, um, that section, I, it was maybe 40% women. I mean, Was it really? Yeah. So it's grown. That's it wonderful has. to know. When I went to seminary the first time, you know, it's predominantly male. Yeah. But by the time I graduated with my second degree from seminary, mm -hmm. so I got a master's degree and finished in 2010, mm -hmm. and then my doctorate in 2014, the women had grown in seminary. Yeah. So I'm glad to hear that there was about 40%. That's wonderful. Well, and Harvard is, it's a divinity school. Right. And you might not know it today. In fact, you wouldn't know it today. But um, Harvard started originally back in the 1600s as as a, a theological school, yeah, right. as a theological it was seminary. A seminary. People and don't realize that. They don't. In fact, the, during my orientation at Harvard, because we were in the Divinity School, um, we all had our little meeting together, and one of the professors was greeting us and welcoming us, and he basically said, like, you guys are the forgotten ones of Harvard. You're the religious ones. A lot of people at Harvard like to pretend like you don't really exist. <laughs> um, but you need to know that if you weren't here, Harvard wouldn't be here because it started, about, it, the, the entire idea was founding a library with books to train up men in religious, religious education. Thing, that's right. that, that is the foundation, honestly, the foundation of our educational system. It is, of all of our education system because yeah. it's the founding of our whole nation. It is. And so now, though, I mean, Harvard, Harvard is not a seminary. So seminaries, the kind of the difference is they tend to be more strongly tied to denominations. They have a real push toward putting preachers out. Um, Harvard does do, uh, you can get an MDiv there. You definitely can go to Harvard and become a pastor in, in any denomination. We, we have people there who are Presbyterians, Baptists, you know, coming from various right. places. But it isn't, um, it doesn't start with, with doctrines, um, it, it starts more with you know just the text, the Bible, and, and we the grow text. from there. So it's interdenominational, I suppose you could say. That's wonderful. And so that um, that may be part of the reason more more women were there than you okay. may see or may have seen in seminaries in, in the past. 
is because yeah, it doesn't it doesn't it didn't spring from a church directly. I see. Now yeah. tell me how this sprung into the, your archaeological. I want to get yeah. into your archaeological sure. archaeological background. Well, so you have something in this book that caused this book, right, yes. to spring off of it. Yes. Tell me about that and yeah. how that transition happened. So when I was at Harvard, I I studied archaeology. That's I went and I dug and how cool archaeology is, is my passion. Biblical, biblical uh, have archaeology. Have you been to Israel? Yes. To yeah. study. Uh, and I've dug, I've dug at Ashkelon most recently at Tel Shimron, which is a relatively new dig um, in, in Galilee. Uh, it's yeah, it's it's what it's did great you find in Highland Galilee? Project. Anything interesting that you would want to tell the viewers about? So I can't. <laughs> you can't. I can't. She um, can't tell us until it has been public. I mean, I, I can I can tell you about the site generally. It was a really large city at the time. It has been continuously occupied from um, the Chalcolithic period. So before the Iron Age, before the Bronze Age, the Copper Age. It, it's been, people have lived there all the way really up until today, um, and it had never been excavated before. So it's kind of a virgin site. Oh, that's We're gonna awesome. be able to learn a lot from it. What's it called again? Shimron. Shimron mm -hmm. and, in Galilee. Yes, and okay. it appears in the Bible, but only two or three places and not as a site where anything happened. It, it'll talk about the king from Shimron. Like it just sort of gets mentioned in there but it was vital to the economy at the time. They were a major, tra major trading partner with Jerusalem. So it's going to reveal a lot about what Israel was like during all of these time periods. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, How but exciting. With archeology, span I, I, I wanna go with you to see all of this. <laughs> you should. I wanna you be should. your assistant. <laughs> <laughs> well, with archeology, span uh, I have a friend who likes to say it's a very expensive hobby. Yes. And that is not an understatement. And so um, universities and the state of Israel and a lot of people fund these digs and so every everything that is found until it is published by the dig directors it's proprietary it's, it's sort of like having a copyright on something I don't want to talk about something really cool that was found there and steal their thunder that's, right. that's not fair to the people they who have are doing to the release hard work. it yeah I understand exactly um, but yeah so I, I dug at the time and obviously I get really animated I love talking about is there anything but, you found that you can talk about yeah um, back uh, years ago I dug at a place called Ashkelon it is right on the Mediterranean Sea it was one of the five capital cities of the Philistines and we found a lot of really cool things there um, most recently Let's see, in 2016, I think it was, that was the last season there, and I wasn't there, but the people who were uncovered, uh, they had been working on excavating a large cemetery, and so there was enough bones there, and there was enough DNA there that scientists who were way smarter than me were able to take it and establish that the Philistines did in fact come from island regions in the Mediterranean. This is something that theologians have theorized for a long time. Philistines are often called the sea people, but the excavations at Ashkelon actually proved that in 2016. So that's great. Um, and then while I was there, um, I uncovered something called a bowl lamp bowl deposit that was perfectly intact. This is something that the Philistines did at the time, but it, um, it was a perfectly preserved bowl, a perfectly preserved lamp, and then another perfectly preserved bowl on top of it. And people would bury that underneath the foundations of their homes as an idea of bringing light and life into, into their home. And so I, I had the honor of pulling that out of the ground, something that was perfectly preserved, not broken. And That um, is very cool. It's neat. I've been on a dig. I went in 2010 or 2009 with a group from seminary um, to Israel on a scholarship. And so we um, we went to all the different cities and major places in Israel mm -hmm. and studied the land and I'd have to test in the bus <laughs> in between places we'd given be given an exam for three weeks because it was a master's degree program yeah. it, was, it was a graduate program sure. through Jerusalem University and yeah. so we would literally learn something and then test on it learn something test on it wow. and it was you know a little you know, I get car sick <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a little hair raising, especially when they would stop you sometimes and these guys would come on the, the bus to check everything out the, from the land, like in Jordan. Yeah. Um, they'd come on with machine guns <laughs> and, yeah. you, and to check everything. But we did a dig also, yeah. and I did find um, a couple of things that were pieces of like pottery or oh, whatever. Yeah. That's everywhere. But you found that's the whole stuff. thing intact. Yeah. That was, that's awesome. Okay, Amanda, tell me about chapter four mm -hmm. and how that sprung off to this book. So chapter four is all about how archaeology helps us to to understand what scripture actually says. It helps us to see, because when you excavate something, 
out, and it comes out of the ground and you can see something that you've never seen before, but that is described in the Bible, it can help you understand scripture better. And so I it like to say- It opens your eyes does. when you're reading verses. It goes, oh, now I understand that. Yeah, there's so many, especially when you get into the poetry of the Old Testament, there's so many images that just don't make sense to us because they're describing art that doesn't exist anymore that we may never have seen. Well, when you uncover art as it is described in the Bible, then suddenly you can picture it and the Bible comes to life. Well, and so, their art was so important because that's how they told their stories back then. Absolutely. They didn't have a lot of written words like Correct. we do today. Yeah. So art was really incredible back then. Yeah. And beautiful. Definitely. And intricate. Yes. Yeah, definitely it was. Art and then in poetry too, because in a pre-literate society, songs and having things that rhyme and lots of imagery, you remember those better. And that's how oral traditions develop. And that's how you pass things down when people can't read. Right. You pass them down by mom and dad tell their children and yeah. then it gets passed down orally. Yeah. And that's mainly how everything went in place during that time period. They couldn't sure. go to a Bible or a book and go, oh, you know, the Bible said this. They right. had the oral tradition. Yeah. Yeah. Very few people could read the scrolls at the time. Well, so that's one chapter in Mary Magdalene. But there's so much that you can talk about when it comes to archaeology. And so I decided to do an entire book and hopefully a, a series of books on, on archaeology and how it relates to the Bible. And so the original idea was to do a direct, here's, you know, here's what is out in the world, um, here's the artifact, and here's how it ties to scripture. But when I went over there and dug, and I ended up taking my husband and my parents with me, they had never been before. We went in 2019, and I got to see Israel through their eyes for the first time. I took them to all of these archeological sites that a lot of your regular tours don't go on, and watching them see it for the first time gave me a different perspective. And so this book became, in a way, it's just sort of my love of all things ancient and even modern Israel because we experienced both. So in going and discovering the archaeology of the land, we also interacted with the people who were there. And we learned a lot about ancient history, uh, modern history. There's a chapter in here. It's right in the middle of the book. It's on Hebron. We ended up going into Hebron, which is the largest city in the West Bank. And we visited uh, the Tomb of the Patriarchs, which oh, is wow. where That's Abraham awesome. and Sarah and all of them are. But we also had the opportunity to Are those time. marked? Abraham oh. and Sarah's places? Yes. Oh, so the Tomb of the Patriarchs is amazing. It was built by Herod the Great at the same time that he was doing the additions and changes on the temple in Jerusalem. And so when you go and you see the foundation stones of the Tomb of the Patriarchs, those are the ones that he put in place and going there and touching those stones that's in a way the closest we can get to the temple as it was 2000 plus years ago when he built it it's an amazing site but it can be tough to get to because it's in the west bank and so while we were there we had the opportunity to spend time with the palestinian family and we got to tour the, the tomb of the patriarchs did they speak english yes that's great. It, it, That's is, helpful. Israel, most people They didn't people speak Hebrew do. regularly to you. No, That's great. You can no. communicate. Yes, yes. It's good. I mean, you, you want to learn, you know, toda means thank you. You know, you want to learn those kinds of words. To, to, I love that. Toda. Toda. <laughs> toda. <laughs> when we know, see each other, gracious. man, they were going to say toda. <laughs> <laughs> I great. love that. I look, um, but this is so that, that got in there, too. That's a story that, you know, I hope I get to, to share with people about. Um, that building and uh, yeah so I talk about how all basically how the history of the Bible and of Israel it's ancient but when you're in that place you cannot separate the two what is ancient is also modern because I mean simply when they're trying to build new roads in Israel archaeological teams have to go in there and excavate first because there's so much, much material underneath culture the there um, and it all matters and so being in Israel is an experience unlike any you'll ever have because of that constant juxtaposition of the two. And so this book that starts off talking about the artifacts really ends up being about understanding the land and the people, all of the people who were there better and you know how, how they live there and how this ancient history in, impacts the way they live their lives today. Well, and what people don't realize when you go to Israel, if you haven't been there, the gate beautiful is there. Yeah. The, a lot of these the are. Gate been and, and the, edited, yeah. you know, 
the fence, all of that, the stones, like there's so much history that you see yeah. the Mount of Olives. I mean, it's there. It is. And those olive trees, some of them have even been dated. I mean, they're 2000 years old right. and they'll have it's little all... plaques on them. And it's like, this tree actually could have been, could have been there when, when Jesus, Jesus was, was there, there praying. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's so exciting. You go there and you go, oh my goodness. Like when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a garden of Gethsemane. Yeah, there's is. a place. There's it all is. these places that are there. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. so exciting. Um, yeah. And so let's see a chapter in here. I want to ask you about wine, war, and walls in the Golan Heights. What is yeah. that? So um, <laughs> that's an interesting title. This, oh, thank you. So we, a lot of people don't know, there's a strong history of viticulture, of winemaking in Israel. In fact, winemaking began in uh, the region of Georgia, and it was very early in Georgia, Turkey, and down into Israel. Israel was one of the oldest winemaking regions in the world. Well, when the Muslims came in and conquered the area. Um, around basically after the Crusades, they got rid of that entirely. And so when the Jewish when the Jewish people started coming back after World War I, they brought vines from Europe and they went into these traditional wine growing areas, which are amazing. Um, in fact, the area of Golan that we traveled to, between its the minerals and its soil, its altitude, all the conditions there really mimic uh, the Bordeaux region of France. Oh wow, so that's awesome. They have taken, now it's been about 20 years, they took ancient vines from Europe, brought them back, they have planted them in the soil there, and they are doing really wonderful wine. And so we went and, and we toured that. that. Yeah, that's currently happening now. Currently they're making now. wine from these vines from France. They are, yeah. Okay. Well, but so the Golan region, um, is an interesting place because it was annexed by Israel. It is legally a part of Israel, but um, a lot of Arabs actually live there today. And so in that chapter, we go and we learn about the wine culture, but then we also learn about um, the, the history of the modern conflicts, like in 1967, the wars between Syria and Israel. Because when you travel there and you're going and you're enjoying the beauty of this wine growing region, right next to it are war memorials to all the people who lost their lives in Israel at the time. And then, you know, we traveled 30 minutes down the road and went to Tel Dan, which was the site of, you know, in the Bible, it'll talk about how the north of Israel was in Dan and Bethel. You know, so we went and we visited the oldest arched gate in the world from the Canaanite time that is in Dan. Um, so in that That's one amazing. chapter, you learn about the modern, you learn about the recent history and the ancient and how it all works together in a in a really well, beautiful Well, people way. need to get these books. <laughs> so I'm going to show them one more time because our time has, has come to a close. <laughs> but you need to get these books. Tell them again how they can get your books. Um, they're really available everywhere, anywhere that you'd like to get your books. Um, Amazon, ChristianBook.com, your local book retailers carry them too. I know my, my Barnes & Noble has them. Thank you, Amanda. Thank we you. We appreciate having you on the show today. It's so great to God talk with you. you. Thank you for watching. Wasn't that so insightful from Amanda? An encouraging word to all of us. And Mary Magdalene is one of my favorite women in the Bible. You know, Psalm chapter 46, verse five says, God is within her, she will not fail. And God certainly showed up for Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was full of seven demons when she encountered Jesus. And Jesus cast those demons out. And Mary Magdalene became a new person. Mary Magdalene is the one that went to follow Jesus. She was one of his disciples. She is one of the very few females at the cross when he died. And Mary Magdalene was the one that he chose after he died to appear to. He appeared to a woman first. So Mary Magdalene, she's one of my heroes. She stuck with Jesus. She spread the good news after he died. And so Mary Magdalene, get the book from Amanda. It's gonna encourage you. She's a hero of the faith, Mary Magdalene. And remember, God is within you. You will not fail. We're glad you came and joined us today and we can't wait to see you soon.